Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha. Welcome to Mina, Marco, and me on energy. I'm Tim Apicella, filling in for Jay Fidel. Today's show, we are fortunate to have as our guest, Public Utility Commissioner-to-be, Jenny Potter, for the second part of the show uh, that took place uh, some time ago. And we're also going to talk about recent events on the island of Hawaii, the impact of lava flows that's having on the Puna Geothermal Venture Facility. It's a safe bet that Marco Mengelsdorf and Jenny Potter will bring discussion points that you won't see in the news or read in the newspaper. And without further ado, ado welcome uh, Jenny and welcome Marco. Thank you. It's good to be well, here. Well, uh, it's been great uh, to be on with you and uh, to be on with Jenny again. Thank you so much, Jenny, for, for joining us uh, today on this Aloha Monday. And uh, yes, I mean, there's no shortage uh, seemingly always about uh, topical energy issues here in the state of Hawaii and and uh, in this particular case in the Big Island uh, especially. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, to kind of kick things yeah. off as far as how how this lava activity is uh, is affecting uh, the Big Island in terms of power generation. I mean, we know of course that. Uh, thousands of people are being affected and have uh, had to be uh, leaving their homes and their, we just went up to more than 100 homes destroyed as of earlier today and that could easily uh, go up rather dramatically with this uh, wide lava flow of a half a mile width that has already hit the ocean in Kapoha which has hundreds of homes so it's really this ongoing disaster for so many people and it's very uh, it's really unsettling for I think anybody anybody on the island whether you're uh, close to the, the volcanic action or on the other side but in terms of energy the uh, Pune Geothermal Venture which has been operating since 1993 for 25 years has been providing uh, firm power to the Helco grid uh, for decades and uh, according to the piece in the Star Advertiser yesterday by a good piece by Rob Perez uh, prior to shutting down earlier this month, or excuse me, about a month ago, PGV uh, was providing somewhere close to 30 uh, percent, actually 29 percent according to the Helco data, 29 uh, percent of the power generation uh, from the beginning of the year, which was the same figure, 29 percent, that it provided last year for all of 2017. So Helco has to obviously bring uh, additional generation, reserve generation online, which they have been doing, and they have been assuring us that there's plenty of reserve online uh, or available to bring online. So in terms of rolling blackouts, that's not in the cards, fortunately. But unfortunately, with the loss of such a um, uh, substantial component uh, in terms of the renewable energy provided into the grid, not just for the Big Island, uh, but especially the Big Island, but also for the state writ large, that it's going to mean inevitably for uh, for the foreseeable future, it appears, that more fossil fuel in the form of petroleum products will have to be consumed here on this island to make up for that PGB shortfall. So that's bad news uh, from a number of perspectives, and Helco is leading the state, in fact, in terms of renewable power generation these past years, creeping up to close to 60 percent of all power consumed uh, last year. Close to 60 percent was coming from renewables, and that was the highest in the state by far. I don't know how much they're going to be hit, but I, I can imagine somewhere in the 10 percent range, although I haven't really crunched the numbers. So it's... Uh, you know, it's interesting. We've been drilling into Madame Pele uh, since the early 1980s when there were test bores that were done in that area. It took a dozen or so years to finally get a power plant online over the very vigorous objections and, and protests of, of folks who believe that it was a bad idea from a, from a number of perspectives. And there a number of them were saying, well, you know, you can only drill into uh, to Pele for so long before she takes issue. So however it's interpreted, PGV is down. and. I happen to believe it's probably down for the count because I just don't see, personally, the popular support nor political will to bring it back. Even This is assuming that it doesn't get overrun by lava, which is a very real possibility. So that's kind of my intro, I guess, about uh, the topical issue that we're dealing with right now. And maybe turn it over to Jenny uh, as far as uh, what uh, what do you see, Jenny, in terms of the impact of, uh, of losing geothermal, the only geothermal plant on the in the state, as far as affecting the state's overall uh, efforts to, uh, to get to the Emerald City-like uh, 
that target of 100% renewable uh, for power generation right. in 2045. So I take uh, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I think that you know this is a great question because I, we we often forget about sort of what the public interest is um, when we when we look at different types of fuel sources and we're thinking about building additional um, generation facilities or whether it's you know going to be distributed um, and I think like you mentioned that there are, there is some real real opposition to bringing it back online and and it, getting and commissioning more plants that would utilize the geothermal um, there's there seems to be several articles have been published you know in, in the newspaper around that where people are like we're going to march in the streets you know it's like yeah. it will not be it won't be fun See, Jenny so, Jenny may I interrupt for a second and I'm sorry can yeah. we clarify what the opposition's about is it about the air quality Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank I you. Think, I think there was some opposition in regards to the proximity of the plant um, to residential neighborhoods. That was a big concern, and um, and I think that you know it was commissioned uh, despite those concerns. But bringing it back online, given what you know what's happening with Madame Pele is is probably going to make it a much more difficult sell. Um, so uh, you know, Puna's probably. I don't know. I speculate that it's it's done, um, but I, my concern is, you know, how how do we get to 100 percent? How do we fulfill our renewable portfolio standards after this incident? Um, when you have these resources that are so um, yeah, that are so complete, you know, we have sun, we have wind, but geothermal is really a nice firm resource, and, and there was a lot of assumptions built into the PSIP and other models that we would increase the amount of geothermal on the and various islands, not just you know Hawaii Energy or I'm sorry Hawaii Island. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, that it's it's disconcerting, and like we mentioned, um, you know, it's probably about three percent of our overall RPS right now is coming from. The Puna, um, so that's gonna. We're gonna have to make that up with other types of resources. Okay. So, which um, which can be challenging because siding wind and solar is is also very difficult. You know, given the public interest around uh, how we're utilizing our space on the islands. And well, what I think also is, is worth noting, guys, is that uh, a number of years ago, Helco did a request for proposals for additional geothermal on the island. Uh, and uh, there were a number of bidders. And the winning bidder to add, if I'm not mistaken, another 30 megawatts of geothermal or thereabouts was Ormat, the same folks mm -hmm. who own the uh, PGV plant. So they were awarded a contract from Helco after a competitive bidding process to bring another 30 megawatts uh, online at that same uh, location. And uh, um, there was, uh, I won't say dancing in the streets, uh, but there was, uh, now the, this was going to be seen as a positive step by a lot of people to further uh, have the Big Island be more energy independent. Well, some time went by, and lo and behold, the folks at Ormat, the folks at Ormat said, no can. They effectively said, we can't go through with this based on what we propose, therefore we are pulling out. Now, I'm not privy to all the details as to why exactly that's, uh, that was the case, but that's in fact what happened. So uh, I guess it's just kind of illustrative of how uh, you know, geothermal uh, is, uh, is, is, I don't know if I would call it a gamble, but there was a reason that, and this is of course before anybody knew that all these fishers were going to open right. up along the East Drift Zone, right, gobbling things up, but there's a reason right. that ORMAT backed out. Right. So I think it again kind of adds to the, yeah. the uh, pretty strong or reasonable conclusion that uh, geothermal uh, in that area, certainly, if not the rest of the island, uh, is uh, highly doubtful, I think. At this well, Mark, you, ra you raise a good point. You said in that area. Um, aren't there areas on West Hawaii and then on Maui that actually are, could be candidates for, for geothermal? I can't speak to Maui because I know less about it. Yeah. And my point would be, uh, in terms of candidates, yes, there has been uh, discussion about the flanks or the saddle area between Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea as a possibility uh, along the slopes of Hualalai, which is our other volcano there on the west side, which rises to about 7,000 feet. But here's the thing. There has been pushback 
by folks who are anti-geothermal against even what I'll call passive survey work. I'm not talking about doing test boreholes, which is more significant, but just doing testing with equipment where you don't have to even dig in the ground. They have pushed back on that uh, in any, to do any type of survey work in any depth. Uh, pun intended, in terms of additional geothermal on the silence. So to me, it just shows the depth and breadth of, of those who are anti-geothermal who don't even want to let the proverbial uh, camel's nose in the tent right. as far as right. even allowing passive survey work to be done uh, in possible hot spots. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So we'll um, we'll see. I mean, uh, as, as everybody's pointing out, you know, it's certainly uh, it's it's a fluid situation. Needless to say, when you have uh, uh, lava still coming to the surface and uh, doing what it's doing, and uh, I mean, uh, whether PGV is going to be there a day from now, a week from now, is all up in up in the air. And you know, one of the reasons why it's, it has received so much concern over the decades is the possibility of essentially a blowout uh, of a wellhead mm -hmm. that would not be controllable. And there have been worst case scenario planning that go back to the early 1990s that in the worst case you would have to do an evacuation X number of miles from the blowout, including maybe going as far as Kao, which uh, if you go as far as Kao in terms of the radius, you're talking tens of thousands of people. So that's, uh, yeah, that's worst case, and, and we don't know. But again, you know, I go back to f five weeks ago. Who is considering? Who is thinking about the likelihood of 24 or more fishers in the East Rift Zone would do what Absolutely. they have been doing for the past four weeks? It's it's the unknowability and mystery of the primal forces of primal forces of nature. Whether you want to ascribe a deity to them in terms of Pele or or, or non personal, it's the inherent unknown of living on this earth in terms of natural events that have been happening for millennia, right? It's, yeah, just, it's, exactly. it's just stunning. Well, I think the question is also, how long can this go? And we don't know. Nobody does. Yeah, so. Nobody. Right, right. There's no end, really, that we're assuming at this point for this. It's unbelievable. It just keeps opening up, too. Well, to uh, to maybe shift away from the the, the lava and fury of uh, of uh, Pele here, maybe uh, let's let's kind of uh, go back to our conversation that we started a number of weeks ago, you and I and Jay, Jenny, in uh -huh. terms of uh, you're going to be uh, uh, a, the next BC commissioner in, by my count, uh, 20, 26, 27 days. I think you actually do. You, do you take an oath on the first day, or have you already taken an oath? Because you officially start on July 1st, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Yes, exactly, which is a Sunday, so I'll take the oath on the 2nd of July. 2nd of July, so you'll you'll be there at the Capitol, and, and the governor will say, now raise your right hand, and you'll say to, to promise to do all kinds of wonderful things in the, to the benefit of Hawaii uh, consumers and ratepayers and the environment, all kinds of stuff like that. I'm, I mean, I'm kind of making this up, but something like that, right? <laughs> something like that, exactly. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure that it's the governor that does it, though. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Well, uh, I'll, I'll, who is it going to be? Is it going to be Randy Wasse, the chair, or is it going to be Mike McCartney, or is it going to be? Who, do you know who's going to be? I don't. I don't know. Um, so that's that's up for. Yeah, I, I'll know when I get there, I guess. <laughs> just, you'll just be pleased. You'll show up, and there will be somebody there who will be more than willing with a big smile on their face and one or two or three or ten lay to put around your neck like a high school or college graduate, right, where you can yes. barely see over the flowers. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's kind of how the Senate confirmation went, too. So that was pretty cool. I was piled high. I, was, I love that custom. It's such a great you know, thing that we do in Hawaii with the lace. It's just really special. Even though it. if it's kind of a steamy day, you can kind of feel a bit, uh, uh, you know, all this, all this, yeah, yeah, it's a little bit humid. But so, so let, let's, let me go back. Well, hang, to, hang on, Marco, because yeah. we're going to take a commercial break here in about. Well, right now, actually. So uh, let's get to the questions as soon as we return. Hi, everyone. I'm Andrea Gabrielli. I'm the host for Young Talents Making Way here on FinTech Hawaii. We talk every Tuesday at 11 a.m. about things that matter to tech, matter to science, uh, to the people of Hawaii with some extraordinary guests, the students uh, of our schools who are participating in science fair. So Young Talents Making Way 
every Tuesday at 11 a.m. only on ThinkTech Hawaii. Mahalo. Hey, aloha, everybody. Thanks for joining us on ThinkTech Hawaii. I'm your host, Andrew Lanning, the security guy. I host a program called Security Matters Hawaii. And I hope you'll join us on Fridays. Uh, we air at 10 a.m. And we're going to be talking about those security things that really should be important to you. And, you know, maybe get behind the scenes on some, some things that you may not know about the industry or about products or even about your habits. Um, security is all about people, processes, and products. And we hope to bring that to you in an informative and um, hopefully a useful way. So, again, 10, 10 a.m. on Fridays, Security Matters Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me. Thank you. Welcome back. I'm Tim Abicella, and I'm here with Marco Mengelsdorf and Jenny Potter, and we're discussing, uh, well, the recent events on uh, with the lava in Hawaii, and and now we're going to talk about some other issues that uh, you know pertain to energy issues for the state of Hawaii. So thank you uh, for holding on there, and welcome back. Thank you, thank you. So. I don't know about you, Ginny, but you know, in my life, and I think uh, most people, when you're uh, when you've got a new job coming up, or you you know you've been you've been accepted to graduate school, or you know things in life that are there a change from from the way you've lived life in the past, whether it's relationship, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, getting into school, whether it's starting a new job, it can often be kind of an anxiety producing experience. So I'm, I'm wondering what, if anything, has you feeling a bit anxious and or excited about uh, becoming the next uh, commissioner in the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission? That's a, that's a great question. I think um, I can talk a little bit about the preparation that I'm doing because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good planner. I'm a good, you know, I can definitely tackle things and, and pack. Um, so I, I am going to be in Honolulu most of the time, so I did have to rent a place there. So I will be coming home on to Maui over the weekend, and these are all things that we had to figure out, you know, um, whether I could live in Honolulu, should I sell my house, you know, how, how am I going to go about doing this, um, this job, and because I do live in Maui. Um, so, you know, I rented a space in Honolulu that I'll be at the majority of the time. So that's Is been, it within walking you know, distance, though, from the commission? I'm actually going to get an electric bike, and according oh, to cool. Google, I can get to work within 10 minutes, which is cool. awesome. So, so I'm very excited about that. I'm going to be walking the walk, so, uh, you know, <laughs> it's good, not just talking. So um, I'm really excited about that. But, yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of details to figure out, you know, furniture and a bed and place, you know, and I'm, although I'm living here. So there's there's been a lot of anxiety around that, preparing to take the position there and be in Honolulu and and prep for um, the, you know a life over there essentially, um, and then I'll leave my family here in you know Maui to continue living. Um, so that's been kind of tough. And then there's those moments too where I'm like, what am I? What are what's expected of me as an you know to be an effective regulator? What does that mean? Um, so so actually, Mina had sent me a, a wonderful link to a website that has. You know, papers, white papers about effective regulation um, and uh, you know actions of efficient regulators, and she said you know, that you know she relied on that heavily. So I spent a lot of time this weekend reading through those essays and those papers to to get a better understanding. And and she you know she was absolutely right. It's fantastic. So I'm I'm studying. Um, and you know, trying to, to figure out you know the best way that I can come in and do this job well. So there is anxiety, um, you know, in terms of that. I feel like I should be spending more time reading dockets, but I have a job I got to do right now. So yeah. so it's um it's tough. There's a little bit of a balancing act of trying to be in both spots um, right now. And I have to imagine both uh, our friend uh, our friends Jay Griffin. And uh, Randy Wasse, uh, the two uh, commissioners who you'll be serving with, have been uh, very supportive, right? Absolutely, they've been great. Yeah, it's been, it's been. They, yeah, they're they're just amazing people, and it's it's great. We're going to have um, a really strong commission. I know Jim Lazar, um, who has done a 
great deal of work here in Hawaii, in particular around cost of service and revenue requirements and all of those really difficult, challenging topics. Um, but he, he said that we're going to be the, the most progressive and amazing you know, com commission in, in the country. Um, and he said Minnesota follows on that, but you know, mm -hmm. he's all with you and Jay on there, it's going to be great. So I'm excited. I see what we can do. Jenny, what, what do you think the thorniest issue will be um, when you, you, get, you hit the ground running? Um, yes. what, what, what policy issue do you think is going to be the thorniest to, to basically uh, take on? I think that um, the performance-based um, initiatives for HECO is going to be challenging. I know that we have legislation that was just signed around that, and then we also have an open docket that was released, gosh, maybe two months ago. Um, I think that's going to be really challenging um, to, to develop incentives that are going to motivate, but basically, you know, taking it from this gentleman who writes about effective regulators, we need to align the private interest with the public interest. And, you know, performance incentives can do that, but we have to really have a vision for what it is we're trying to accomplish in the name of, you know, the public interest. So I think um, that's actually going to be really challenging. Uh, we, we don't want to hurt HECO in, in too much. We, mm -hmm. uh, we want to help them, you know, but we want to make sure that we're, we're serving the people in the interest of, of you know, Hawaiian, Hawaii right. citizens. Um, so, so, yeah. It's well, you've done a lot of market reason. research in the past, and you've done a heavy research about what the market's kind of what they want and what they hope to expect. Um, will you continue on that path? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's important to get you know, I'm going to definitely be more in the details, um, I think, uh, just because I like them. And I think that we need to pay attention to uh, how consumers are participating in with the electric utility and providing services to the grid and what we can do, you know, on the demand side um, rather than the supply side to get to 100% renewable. Um, and I definitely am invested in, in being creative around that um, and, and really trying to invoke participation from Kiko customers, Maui Electric customers, that whether it's seamless to them and they, they you know, plug and play and they don't actually notice changes and they just allow for, you know, the, the energy market and, and grid needs to, you know, change their water heater, take, turn it on and turn it off, you know, or whether they're actively participating in a real-time pricing kind of initiative. Um, I think it's important that we bring the people of Hawaii along um, and, and definitely develop a closer relationship with them. So that market research and, and the work that I've done there, I hope that that comes and supports some of, you know, the broader um, initiatives that, you know, we come up with along the way. So Sounds like a great approach. Well, this may kind of put you on the spot a little bit, Jenny, and you can, of course, uh, deflect as, as you need to. Uh, if you look back to the docket uh, that was open to consider the acquisition of Hawaiian Electric Industries by NextEra, uh, the commission adopted a fairly open-door policy in terms of allowing virtually any and all comers to be interveners on that docket. At one point, there were, I believe, 25 or 26, which is probably something of a record. Uh, the the performance-based regulation, PBR docket, which has been opened, there are now, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 11 parties who have asked to either be an intervener or a participant. I'm not sure if that decision, uh, the, well, whether uh, your uh, fellow commissioners-to-be will wait until you get on board or whether um, they will decide with Lorena Kiba in the, in the days to come. But uh, can you, are you willing to kind of tip your hand in terms of your philosophy, at least with the PBR docket, as far as whether it should be kind of open door allowing as many as the, the 11 who have applied or, or to keep it more more kind of focused uh, amongst the smaller group. Mm. So that's that's a great question. And one of the things is, uh, that I understand about being a commissioner is, you know, we evaluate facts and and information that's provided through the docket process, and we really have to rule on those, that information that's provided. And that would be that would come from interveners, and it would come from the general public, and to some degree. But the, the facts that are presented during that docket are those are the ones that we have to make the decision based on, right? So ultimately, to me, you know, the more 
people that participate and can provide input um, about these really tough and you know initiatives that I think is helpful because it provides us with more information and more hopefully facts about you know about how to make a decision in, in each docket so I would be supportive of having you know more interveners through those processes rather than um, because because yeah they, they, they a lot of them do their own research and then bring it right. to the table, and it's more analysis that we can consider. Um, and so that's really helpful. Well, given given the the depth and breadth and the complexity of, of something as significant as effectively imposing a rather different business model on a private company in terms of uh, how HECO and HECO companies do their business, do you have much in terms or many in terms of concerns as far as what we'll call the discovery process, which I believe the commission has referred to essentially as phase one over, I believe it's nine months, that mm -hmm. uh, with uh, a dozen or, or one fewer than a dozen uh, participants, interveners, not including the consumer advocate, that things could be turned into something of a circus in terms of uh, information requests flying willy-nilly, going in all kinds of interesting directions. Is that much of a concern of yours? Um, not really. I think that I, I think that there can be limits that you know I, if you ask the right questions and if you you know present questions around that you know that you have a vision for that are decisive and you know that can can help inform the decision making process, then it's, it shouldn't be too difficult. I think you know I think that yeah, I don't I don't think so. I think it'd be okay. Okay. Well, that's, that's encouraging. Uh, I'm going to ask you another kind of pointed question here in the time we have uh, remaining. How would you judge the success or lack of thereof, the success of this past legislative session relative to energy and regulatory issues? I think I'm going to have to pass on that one because, <laughs> you know, I'm not as, as saturated as I'd like to be in, in what happened in the legislature in the last year. So I well, think we have, it would be... I'm sorry. We have less than a minute yeah. left. And so, um, Marco, do you have one, one, one more question for her? Uh, well, let's see. A minute's pretty darn quick. Um, no, I think... Uh, I mean, I'll just uh, reiterate that uh, I think the governor's choice in you, Jenny, was, uh, was a home run by far, and um, I think this is the first time that we'll have that, as far as I know, at least in my being a, a regulatory watcher, so to speak, that we'll have mm -hmm. two people who, are, you know, who grew up, uh, so to speak, you and, and Jay Griffin, deep in the weeds in terms of uh, the technical matters, the regulatory matters uh, that uh, are going to be really important as we move further into the 21st century, and since the utility of today is far different than the utility of even 10 years ago, let alone 100 years ago in, in oh, Edisonian yeah. days. So I, I couldn't be more pleased that uh, the two of you will be there along with uh, Randy Awase, who, uh, mm -hmm. who will be our guides uh, in the years uh, to come across an incredibly diverse and complex and exciting and turbulent uh, energy environment. And of course, you guys also do transportation and communication. So this is, you know, I think it's it's a big part of your portfolio, but uh, I think that uh, we'll have a fantastic lineup with uh, with the three of you. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate your vote of confidence. I think you're right, though. It's going to be an outstanding journey. So, well, Jenny, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Marco, My thank pleasure. you for all your insightful questions. That's all we have for today. I'm Tim Apicella, filling in for Jay Fidel, and we'll see you next week. Aloha.